The following is meant for entertainment and educational purposes. It is not meant to establish a doctor-patient relationship. Please consult your mental health provider for your mental health needs. Hello, welcome to Shayarik, where we talk about psychiatry and religion with a focus on how to apply it to your life. My name is Dr. Eric. I'm a psychiatrist who happens to be religious, and we're going through the William James series on the varieties of religious experience. And in particular, we're talking about the value of saintliness, and this is part four. Uh, and we're almost halfway through. There are seven parts total. And it's a really good, I, I like it. <laughs> I like the topic, it's pretty interesting. William James makes certain steps to demonstrate that it is best to t test the value of saintliness through under common sense, to understanding the fruits of, of what we're experiencing. And that he really is against this idea of dogma, right? And the church using dogmatic practices, but recognizes that these are the things that kind of happen because of human nature. In particular now, we're in the place where he wants to talk about individual fruits that we see that can really go awry, causing the church to do very, very bad things that isn't the, um, the, 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 the source of the original, truly good, pure experience that the church was founded on, the mystic that uh, the church was founded on. So in particular, today we'll be talking about devoutness, but next time we'll be talking about uh, purity, tenderness, and charity. Okay. So William James, let's, let's recap a little bit. William James recognizes that the fruits of religion can be corrupted by human processes, and therefore common sense must guide the way. And problems can arise when there's too much of an extreme in one area. So the saints, when they're spiritually strong, and he points this out a lot. He says the saints can be spiritually strong, but then they could potentially be deficient intellectually. And that this uh, spiritual excitement can take on pathological forms when other interests are too few, and then the intellect is too narrow. It's just too focused on, on one particular thing. And again, we see this in uh, devoteness, purity, chastity, and asceticism. So William James goes through this in detail, of course. And the first thing we'll be talking about is devoutness. Devoutness, when in balance, leads to fanaticism. And I think we're familiar with, with this idea of religious fanatics, is loyalty to an extreme. And he describes it is that uh, the fanaticism idealizes the devotion itself. And it, it, its immediate consequence is that there's jealousy over the, the God's honor. And even the slightest insult or neglect must be resented. And the enemy of God must be put to shame. That is the nature uh, of this. And so it's interesting that it's almost as if it's like idolizing the devotion as opposed to worshiping uh, God. Churches with imperialistic sort of policies use this fanaticism, use this devoutness uh, to conquer other nations. And this intolerance and persecution has become associated with vices with the saintly mind, right? And no, no doubt that they're sinful, right? However, the saintly temper is a moral temper, meaning that the saintliness, being a saint, you also have morality with that. It chooses a side, and therefore, uh, in this fanaticism thing, it's choosing the wrong side, a cruel side. And fanaticism is the wrong side of religion as long as that religion worships a despotic kind of god okay a god that's a, a, a cruel it's a ruler it, it you know uh, yells at us all the time and uh, once the god is intent uh if this god is like wants honor and glory right uh, oh sorry if this god is less intent on honor and glory and conquering then this fanaticism is no longer a danger it's just uh a thing, right? It's just something that people kind of love and worship. If God is focused on like love and kindness, that's better. Fanaticism is often found when someone is, he said, masterful and aggressive. And he contrasts this with the saint who is gentle, and let's get back to it, the intellect is weak. All right? And he cites um, Margaret Mary, I'm saying this right, Alakwe, uh, Saint Gertrude, and Saint Teresa. And he pointed out that they were very, very spiritual, but they weren't known to be very intelligent. Versus someone very, very spiritual, and presumably he was very, very intelligent and aggressive and masterful, 
may be inclined to then take that devoutness, turn it into fanaticism, then start killing a lot of uh, things. And so James criticizes that um, a God who cares to micromanage every small account of uh, one's shortcomings while also providing small favors, right, is too small-minded of a God for him to consider. And he's not really impressed with devo devotion as a fruit. So he doesn't really feel that devotion is a very uh, good fruit based on his you know, running of common sense. That's his uh, thing on devotion. What's interesting about devotion uh, is that it seems to um, fill in that gap of uncertainty. And what do I mean by that? It seems like when we are uncertain, we feel anxious. And in that anxiety, we don't like our existence. When we fill uncertainty with uh, some sort of dogma, we get rid of that anxiety. And since the only entities or only people that uh, lose out are other people, then it doesn't really affect us or ourselves. And that's why there's always this temptation in the religious uh, sphere to be devout at the expense of self-reflection, at the expense of truth. And the most extreme version would be fanaticism, or it's at the expense of a true relationship with other people. And that is where James is kind of pointing out that we look at devoutness as a potential fruit. Oh, one should be devout. We look at the extreme versions of it. We find that I'm not really all that interested. I'm not interested in the extreme fanatical version of the of the doubt, right? I'm sorry, extreme fanatical version of devoutness, right? I don't want that, right? But when I look at the best versions of devoutness among the saints that were a weak intellect, he said, they might be all nice and everything, and they rely on God for everything. But he doesn't really care much for a God who cares about every little itty bitty thing. Now, some people might, you know, I'm not going to knock it. That's, that's William James's position. I'm not against a God that cares about our little thing. You know, I, I get that every now and then. You know, sometimes I want a good day and pray to God for a good day or something like that. However, he's pointing out that when we're valuing devoutness as a fruit, as something of a value of saintliness, he's not, she's not all that interested. So that's devoutness, and we'll go through the other ones next time. Uh, I think it's charity, tenderness, uh, and purity. Okay, so I'll see you later. Have a nice day. Uh, talk to you next time. Bye. Hey, sign up for my weekly newsletter. I send out emails every week on psychiatry and religion. I realize that email is a great way to go deep into these topics. So if you want more content, check out shayareekpurel.com and subscribe over there. Thanks.